Okay, um, so I'm Damien Lemoy from Western Digital, and we'll be so presenting the work we've been doing and are still doing on file system support for uh, zone block devices that you may know as today SMR drives, but we have more coming in terms of devices like this. So uh, I'll give a first a quick background uh, on zone block devices and what we have today uh, in the kernel in terms of support. Then uh, now Hilo will uh, present the work we've been doing on, on better FS uh, and performance evaluation results that we, we got with that. And uh, we'll conclude with some future work for uh, supporting even more of these uh, new devices. So, zone block devices, again, today uh, uh, you're, uh, you're likely to um, use those as SMR drives. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the, the only really, uh, that's a major uh, uh, type of device uh, that is zone out there. So what are these? Uh, unlike uh, a regular uh, uh, hard disk drive or SSD, the LBA range of the device is divided into zones uh, and each zone has a type. Uh, you have conventional zones, and those are basically uh, similar to what you can do on, uh, with a, a regular uh, hard disk, meaning that they accept random writes, random reads, anything you want to do. There's no special uh, constraint for using the LBAs in those zones. Uh, the, the major difference of these devices with regular disk is that they have uh, sequential write required zones that must absolutely be uh, written sequentially. Uh, if you do not write sequentially, the device fails uh, the writes. So how it's done, uh, the device advertises to the host uh, a write pointer, and any write has to be issued at uh, with the start, starting LBA that is equal to the right pointer position. So since you have, of course, uh, uh, command queuing going on, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, command you send, the next right command you send is, of course, the, start, the right pointer position plus the size of the previous command. So that when that command gets processed, it starts LBA correspond to the uh, new right pointer position. So the drive is always going to, of course, process these writes in order they are issued. Uh, a zone uh, must be reset before it's rewritten. You cannot overwrite uh, something that was uh, that you already wrote within the zone, and the reset destroys all that in the zone. So you cannot read your data uh, from the zone anymore. Any read command that is issued after the, the zone write pointer basically re returns garbage data or zeros. And uh, all of this is exposed directly to the uh, to the host. So any user, meaning kernel or application of these drives, must absolutely be aware of this sequential write constraint and, uh, um, and sequentially write to the disk per zone. The sequential write pattern doesn't have to be overall uh, in the entire disk, it's per zone. So what we have today uh, for, uh, in terms of support in the Linux kernel, so since this all started with kernel uh, 4.10, uh, prior to that, Hannes did a lot of work on the ATA um, stack to, for the, the SAT layer. Uh, so the block layer, uh, SCSI, libATA, all of that is covered. There's a, there's a few commands that are specific to zone block devices to SMR, uh, for SMR uh, hard disk. This is all supported. And there is absolutely no intelligence at all at that layer, meaning that the block layer doesn't hide the sequential write constraint uh, uh, of zones. The only thing that it does is prevent any read or write uh, command to span uh, zones. So there are some, some other constraints. A write cannot span, uh, cannot span a zone boundary. So the block layer is going to split that any write uh, like this um, so that it is fully contained within the zone. So this is the only thing that the, the block layer does. The other uh, support you get from it is uh, guarantees that if uh, you do submit BIOS sequentially, properly sequentially per zone, uh, the block layer is going to guarantee that those writes are uh, issued to the device in the same order. So we implemented the, uh, 
write ordering guarantees uh, there so that a well-behaved application can use the drive correctly. On top of that, there is a two class of, of uh, application or, or users, including kernel, uh, kernel components, uh, that you, you can have. Uh, so if we look at the user space, uh, basically you can have legacy application that you want to run on top of those drives, in which case you will need kernel support for hiding that right constraint because legacy application do not, um, are not uh, implemented to, uh, in, to have only sequential writes. So that can be done through a file system, so you get a POSIX interface and the, the, the POSIX implementation of it comes from the file system. If you want a direct block access from your application, you will need to use a device mapper that is going to hide the, the sequential write constraint. Then other class of application is application that were optimized for uh, SM1 drives. So they are aware of the sequential write constraint of the zone organization of the drive, uh, in which case they can go straight through the uh, block device file to the block IO layer, or you even using SEIO if they want to. So these are the two main classes. And for uh, uh, BetterFS Works, so it's part of the, the supporting legacy applications by uh, implementing support within a, a POSIX file system. So device mapper, uh, what is it that, that hides that sequence concerns? It's called DM zone. So it was added uh, with kernel 413, I think. Uh, and what it does is use conventional zones on the disk as a persistent uh, write buffer for random writes. So any write uh, that goes into a sequential zone that is not at the, the, the zone write pointer, well, we, since we cannot uh, directly write that, that uh, data in the, in the sequential zone, uh, there's a temporary uh, holding place using a conventional zone, so you do buffering there and you end up with kind of a, a remapping of LBAs from the logical disk to the physical disk. And to simplify things, instead of doing that per block, uh, we do that, the, that remapping per zone. So it's, it's much less metadata to handle, meaning that the logical uh, device exposed by the device mapper uh, is chunked with chunk size is equal to the zone size, and we keep remapping zones to either conventional zone or sequential zone, uh, depending on where the data uh, for the, the chunk is written on disk. And of course, uh, so this is simple. Uh, we only use a few, uh, I think it's three or four uh, zones for 15 ter terabyte disk to hold metadata. In memory, it's about three to four megabytes uh, only being used, uh, for, again, for a 15 terabyte drive. And the, the code is fairly simple, but the fact that we have this constant uh, remapping of zone and moving data from conventional zones to sequential zones, uh, your mileage may vary in terms of performance depending on, on the workload. There is garbage collection going on in the background and that uh, steals bandwidth from the drive, so your application sees lower performance. So that's why we started with also uh, doing native file system support so that you can remove that overhead. And today, what we have in the kernel is basically only F2FS. Uh, that was added with kernel uh, 4.10, so together with the, the base support for zone block devices. So why F2FS? Well, simply because supporting SMR drive with it was very simple. Uh, it was very straightforward. Uh, it's based on um, F2FS, LFS mode, which is the, the pure log structure operation of the file system, meaning that it does not try to optimize with uh, update in place for metadata blocks. So that's something you have to know is that the, by default, F2FS, despite claiming to be a log structure file system, uh, does a lot of in-place writes for optimizing so that it doesn't have to constantly update uh, its metadata for pointing to the, the last block, copy and write uh, a new version of the of blocks. So uh, other thing is that the, the, on this data structure was actually very easy to um, configure without any change at all to match uh, the zone organizational drives. So what happens is that F2FS has two megabyte segments. A segment is always written uh, in LFS mode, it's always written sequentially. So all we had to do is uh, group these segments, which are called sections, actually, and match section size to zone size. 
and ensure that uh, uh, beside the already existing uh, sequential uh, use of segments, uh, use segments within section sequentially too. So we end up with a, a purely sequential block collection within section and can achieve um, uh, right, sequential right patterns for each ex section. Uh, and to do that, all we had to do actually was add a single uh, mutex per section, so they have active section, but a mutex to basically ensure that block allocation and bioissuing is atomic. The block allocation uh, guaranteeing a sequential allocation, we end up with a sequential uh, um, pattern for writes uh, there, with uh, only adding a mutex. The only problem with F2FS, so it's not really enterprise class file system. It has a limit of 16 terabytes, so it's very limited in terms of support for SMR drive. We next generation is going to be way uh, much larger than uh, than uh, 16 terabytes. You may have seen the announcement, but we'll come up with a 20 terabyte model next year. So F2FS is out, cannot support that. Also, uh, F2FS has a lot of in-place metadata. So it requires conventional zones to handle that, so that those metadata are not copy and write, so we can't, we really need uh, random updates for those. So it's fairly limited, uh, and so since this uh, support, we've been looking at other file system, uh, XFS being one, BetterFS the other. Uh, XFS needs a lot more work, so we started uh, development with BetterFS, and now Hilo will talk about it. Okay, <laughs> I'm Nohiro, and I'm taking over ButterFS part, and I'm working on ButterFS native JBB support. Uh, I'll show you uh, what we need to do support um, ButterFS for uh, the JBB, and how it is the performance of it. So, uh, what we need to be addressed for JBB sequential write. Uh, there are three things. The first one is the alignment of device extent. But I uh, currently allocate and use uh, basically fixed size uh, blocks from device as a uh, device extent. We need to modify device extent allocator so that they are always zone aligned and not uh, contained zone boundary. And the second one is block allocation for our file data or metadata in a block group. Uh, once blocks are created uh, in a block group, ButterFS can reuse freed uh, blocks for a new allocation. Uh, such reusing, of course, causes uh, a random write in a zone. And the final one is avoiding random write entirely. So, provided that uh, sequential allocation and copy on write, uh, we may expect all the writing as sequential. Actually, not. We often see the random writing styles. Uh, easy example is super blocks, and uh, it's copied. Uh, they are written uh, at the fixed location. That means uh, they require random writing. And another example is disordered by a synchronous checksum. And during the data writing process, data is checksummed by multiple checksum workers. It leads to the disordering of IO submission. And uh, metadata write is uh, metadata write. Uh, basically, metadata writes are ordered by transaction, but uh, we have some optim uh, optimization for uh, uh, F-Sync. And that trigger optimization uh, causing the random writing. Okay, let me describe the detail one by one. Okay, the first part, uh, device extent management. To is the right point of management, uh, we mouse uh, one device extent to one zone. And one zone is uh, to 56 megabyte on most SMR disk on the market today. Now with this setup, uh, block groups is naturally aligned to zone for all red labels, and we don't have any zone boundary within a block group. Okay, then the second part, uh, block allocations in a block group. Uh, we add a new allocator for a block to consist of sequential zones. In a such block group, allocations are always done in sequential. 
So uh, with aligned uh, to zone and city and shower kitchen uh, shown is done. But uh, as I said before, unfortunately, uh, there are a uh, lot of random writing stuff still. Um, in Bataille class, we have several data writing paths. Uh, for example, normal uncompressed write, or compressed write, or write into pre allocated region uh, that is uh, uh, allocated, or direct IO. And this uh, right figure shows an overview of normal write and compressed write. And there is a, uh, two problems within uh, normal write paths. First problem is that allocation and IO submission is not atomic. As a right, uh, result, it can happen that uh, process A allocate block, uh, say, zero, and process B allocate uh, block one, and before the process A send bio uh, for block zero, process B can submit its block one. And as a result, it breaks the uh, sequential write restriction in uh, sequential zones. And the second problem is asynchronous checksum. And during the write pass, and data is pushed into checksum uh, queue, and checksum worker grabs that data, calculate checksum of it, and actually submits the bio to device. Uh, since uh, there is a smart proof workers, basically uh, passive view, data is not always submit to the disk uh, with uh, passing first of manner within the compression queue. So, uh, how to solve it? Uh, fortunately, we have nearly ideal IO paths. Uh, take a look at the right side of the figure. Uh, it is a compressed right path. Uh, after a compressed by workers, uh, we see really good IO paths here, this uh, red line. Uh, allocation and uh, IO submissions are in the same context and uh, it checks some of the data in place. So we can just write like this, uh, we provided the async checksum is disabled uh, in normal write. And so we added the uncompressed write in zoned pass, and it behaves like the compressed pass without uh, this uh, compressed part. So now, how to implement the sequential data write in ButterFS? Uh, first of all, it deserves a synchronous checksum, not to break the order there, like in compression pass. Do it in, in place in sync, synchronously. And uh, we added a pair block group mutex. It is taken at the time of allocation and released after the pages in the or the arcade extent is submitted. As a result, now our question and submit are all atomic. Uh, so, but the, with that uh, mutex, uh, the power is, is reduced, of course. So, uh, so the, but the, we have the mutex in um, power block group, so we can use uh, trial lock and just don't wait for the lock block group and try another one or try a new block group. With that modification, a parallel operation is still possible with the different block groups. So data size is done like that, and how about the metadata side? Metadata blocks are also uh, located like in data block group. Uh, OS sequential. And a good point of metadata is that uh, metadata writes are grouped per transaction. All metadata in active um, transaction are basically sequentially uh, written to the disk. But uh, we still have the bad point. Uh, bad point is during B3 manipulation, uh, three node blocks can be uh, merged or split in, uh, with uh, B3's nature. As a result, some three node blocks maybe became uh, unused. And ButterFS optimized not to write such uh, once allocated, but now unused three node blocks. 
But of course, it is program in sequential required zones. So zone butterfly files are like dummy zero field um, node three node blocks instead. And uh, another one, we can have random metadata write uh, when Xsync is invoked. With Xsync, uh, butterfly files allocate a metadata block and write small operation logs related to that Xsync files and sync that blocks. Uh, this is optimization to speed up the Xsync. And this causes the uh, random writing. So on zone butterflies, three log is currently disabled. Okay, uh, now let's see the performance. Uh, we use uh, three hardware in the experiment. First one is regular. Uh, it is just a regular six terabyte SAS disk. And the second one is the uh, zone MU. It is same regular six terabyte disk, but with uh, ZBC firmware. So the mapping and uh, mental so, Hold on, just an explanation here. Why we did this is that uh, the fact that we're using we're using the exact same disk for both regular and ZBC in that case. Uh, we are sure that any performance difference we are going to observe is due to the, the software changes because mechanically speaking and also in terms of LBA mapping within the, the disk, we have added identical things here. So any performance difference comes from the changes in the IO pattern from, from the software and how the drive is being used. It's not the drive itself because the third case you'll see it's a different, uh, completely different drive generation drive model and we cannot compare that directly with uh, a regular disk. Okay, and the third one is zoned. Uh, this is a real uh, SMR drive with 14 terabyte. Uh, it is newer than the zone on the MU from where. And on these devices, we run two types of workloads. One is a uh, data heavy workload, FIO. Operations are uh, write only, read only, and read write mix pattern and with file size of one megabyte to four megabyte random size case and six size uh, two five six megabyte case and number of jobs are set to one two four eight up to 64. and the second one is metadata heavy workload the event and with number of clients to be uh, one two four eight up to 32. Okay, let's look at the file result. Uh, left one is the small files workload with one megabyte to four megabyte random sized uh, files. And right one is a larger files workload with fixed to five, six megabyte file size. And the result shows zone MU is really competitive with regular, these uh, two underlines. Mm. Mm? Dotted line. Dotted line, yes. <laughs> And by increasing the number of jobs, seek overhead uh, is also increased. As a result, uh, we see performance degradation here from one to ten, two or four jobs. And a uh, new generation 14 terabyte derived, the above line, uh, achieves higher performance as shown in zone. So it's only due to the fact that the drive is just faster because it's newer generation. So it's higher density, more sectors per track. One revolution gives you more sectors, so it's higher throughput uh, compared to the six terabyte models. Yeah. And next, uh, right only case, um, zone MU is um, competitive with regular, as same as in the red case. And the performance is quite stable compared to the later cases. This is because uh, device write cache has a seek overhead. Also, uh, same as the later workload, the add zone case shows a better result. And read write mixed case with 70% uh, read and 30% write. It's just uh, some uh, throughput of both read and write. Uh, on both sides, they show very stable performance. So it's really good, isn't it? <laughs> but now let's look at the result of the event. This is a uh, metadata heavy workload. Regular is scaling very well with this uh, blue dotted line. 
However, Don Emu and Zone is scaring really poorly this flat line. Mm, this is because of disabling the tree log. We confirmed that uh, by disabling tree log, regular also degrade to near performance like uh, this uh, blue mm, straight line. <laughs> and uh, to confirm the observation more clearly, uh, I wrote a patch to enable tree log in zoned WebFS. With that patch, uh, we can enable tree log on zoned devices. Then um, zoned and zoned AMU improves uh, really like the uh, scaling really well, like uh, this uh, actual blue and orange line. And but we still have uh, with that. Even with that patch, we still observe some small difference from blue dotted line and other lines. And this is explained by a sync checksum and inefficient of current uh, block allocator, uh, which is waiting the locked block group. And by forcing uh, regular to do always sync checksum, and regular and zone shows quite near performance. Okay. So uh, we see the, this result, and so we find the tree log is really problemsome. So how to enable tree log in zone but I guess, uh, we can consider several approach. Uh, method one is uh, forcing tree log blocks allocated in conventional zones. Uh, we don't have sequential write constraint in conventional zone, so we can fully rewrite uh, anything in that uh, zone, and tree log is also ac accepted. And uh, since the number of tree log blocks is small and uh, they are really temporal, it must uh, limited conventional zone space. And this uh, method is used in the previous result. And the second method is to use a dedicated block group for tree row blocks. Basically, uh, with this method, uh, we maintain two metadata block groups. One is only for tree row blocks, and the other is for uh, other metadata. With this setup, we can write both tree log and other metadata sequentially in for each streamlines. And the benefit of this method is that we can uh, press tree log blocks in sequential zones. So it limits the dependency of conventional zones. Mm. Method one is easy to implement, but um, depends on, on conventional zones, so the method is two is uh, preferred. Okay, uh, in summary, uh, we have some performance problem because of disabling the tree log, but the basic design should be fine now. I will implement the second method and to address the tree log's performance problem, and we post the next version of uh, patch trace to the rest. And uh, finally, I talk about some future things. And VME is zoned namespace support. Uh, zoned namespace and uh, ZNS expose uh, flash delays as sequential write only zones. Uh, we have two benefits of the, this. Uh, one is we can simplify the device FTL, so the reduce, we can reduce the device DRAM size. And the second one is that we can reduce the need for uh, device over positioning. So, so um, and of course, the consequ direct consequence of both points is that you get higher capacity devices with more predictable access limits because of less FTL in the way. So, uh, however, uh, ZNS does not define the conventional zone type, or the zones are seeking some right only. That means uh, we cannot write super block without modification, of course. So to support ZNS on ButterFS, we can use uh, the two sequential zones as a circular link, and use uh, blocks sequentially over two sequential zones. 
uh, for writing newer version of Superblock. And uh, zone right pointer in, indicates that newest Superblock position. So we can read that uh, newest one and uh, work like as before. And also, NVMe ZNS then defines zone append command. It is similar to nameless right. Uh, we don't set right position in right because just uh, zone. Yeah, so you, you basically issue writes without telling where you want the data being written. You just say, I, uh, write data in that zone. And the, the, the drives gives you back in the reply uh, where it was written, which is, of course, at the right pointer. Yes. So uh, we, oh, OK. It's Chun? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so for the flash storage, is there a requirement that you have to sequentially write the blocks inside an erase block? Yes. The media is like this. Oh, it is? Yes. So that's why you have these, these complex FTLs in SSDs that cause problems, latency, garbage collection, going on. Okay, so I know drive. that you cannot rewrite blocks within an erase block, yeah, but I didn't know that you have to actually sequentially write blocks within an erase block, yeah. Hello, again. Okay. So the reason is they sequence the writes in the blocks in, within a raised zone to minimize the disturb of one write next to the other. So it's not like SMR physically where you have to be contiguous because of the way that you shingle tracks. It's more that you write in a sequence that minimizes the disturb when you write the next you know, page within an erase block. So uh, is the write pointer preserved over a power failure or something of that sort? Yes. Okay. The, the reason I'm asking is because where do you find the super block when you're using a... It is yeah, the, okay. the right pointer, so it is maintained by the device. The right pointer persistence is also consistent with the right cache handling uh, on the device. So if you send a write and it's only in the right cache, the right cache of the device is not flushed yet, you get a power down. So the data in the right cache is not on media. So when you restart, you will see your right pointer at the old position not changed. Okay. So only if you... If you issue a, a flush, a synchronous cache from the host and everything gets written to media, then atomically, together with the, the data written on media, the, the right pointer is persistently updated also. Okay. Uh, another question with the write sequence is, uh, uh, how do you handle direct writes, or rather parallel direct writes in ButterFS? So like, do you allocate each direct write to a different zone, or it doesn't, it's not necessary? You mean direct IO? Direct IO, yes. Uh, I think we disable that, right? No, no, no. Actually, no. the in ButterFS direct IO is always uh, also copy on write it. Uh, uh, not always. You can have a no cow. No data cow. But uh, we disable the no data cow. Yeah, you uh, cannot okay. have no cow so with the SMR drives. Yes. You have to go sequential anyway. So oh, okay. direct writes are not, and so that's why no cow is not an option. No, but yeah. even in parallel direct writes, you can have a race, right? So. How, how do you handle that? Uh, same way, of, uh, basically the block allocation and I/O issuing is, is atomic. So okay, even you parallel, mean, it's, it gets serialized. Uh, one okay, goes okay, before okay, the okay, other. Okay, yeah, you have that mutex, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So zone append, uh, you issue a write with an LBA that is just pointing to a zone, and in the reply, you actually get. Uh, back the uh, LBA word that I was written. Uh, so, which means that uh, you can send your writes in any order you want. You always get back where it was written. You do not get an IO error because you did not send those writes in a specific order. So, that simplified all the things we, we, we patched with the, the block group mutex, um, a lock, and uh, a block allocation, and, uh, and IO string being atomic, etc. That's not necessary. But the problem is clear, is that you cannot handle your writes or your, your write back of dirty data with the, the current code, which is block allocation first or extent allocation first and then issue to a specific position. You have to do the reverse. You have to issue your writes first and use the data, the, the reply uh, from the device with the position to tell the block allocator, okay, now I'm, I'm using those blocks. So it's a completely different set of changes. But the advantage is that we can keep uh, all the asynchronous checksum, checksumming, for example, 
uh, anything really that is uh, asynchronous in BRFS today can stay there because we do not care in what order things are going to be processed because in the end, all we need to do is atomically uh, uh, process that uh, uh, allocator block allocator update. It's not a, an actual block allocation because the drive that did that for you, you just need to tell the block allocator where blocks are being used now. Uh, and that's an important point because right now the async checksum being off on HDDs is not really a problem because the CPU can keep up with the speed of the drive because drives are slow, but that's going to be probably a very big problem here. Uh, without async checksum, we probably won't be able to get uh, the maximum performance of, of SSDs, fast SSDs like this. So this is going to be uh, probably a key thing to support for uh, getting good uh, ZNS, uh, NVMe ZNS drive support. And that's it for now. Any question? I have one more, like more common than a question. So, so I've seen you, you have used dbench for like testing metadata intensive workload. So, so dbench is actually not as much metadata intensive as F-Sync intensive because mm. the workload size is really small. It's just a couple megabytes per client. So in Linux, actually, most of this stays in the cache and just, you know, and most of the data actually generated by dbench also stays in page cache and gets deleted actually before uh, and write back stars or before we actually get to write the data or metadata to disk. Just there are, there are a couple of F-Sync operations within the command sequence and th these are actually what performance of these F-Syncs is what determines F-Sync, uh, of yeah. what determines dbench performance. At least that's what been like our experience from our performance testing of various file systems. So, so it's just a note that actually it's very natural that you have spotted tree lock as the bottleneck for dbench because as I said, F-Sync is what, like F-Sync latency is what matters for dbench performance. Uh, but maybe it may be interesting to try a different benchmark like FS mark or mm. stuff like that that's actually metadata intensive yeah uh, totally agree with you uh, again so it was easy to run we ran it and that's when we start spotted the problem so uh, that was a mean for us to to see if we can fix that but clearly we we knew those, those points and uh, uh, having used dbench a lot on different file system, I, I knew it. So the, what we, we just lacked some time to complete this, but for example, uh, so we, we didn't specify a sync option with, with yeah. uh, FIO there, but like the, the small file workload, clearly if you have an application that is writing a file, you always do an F-sync at the end. Mm -hmm. Any application does that. We don't have that there, but that, that would be a much better, I think, uh, uh, case to check the F sync optimization. The same with the large file probably won't have any effect uh, because of the, the, the difference in, in, in amount of data versus metadata. But that's something, yes, we need to check with, with this and uh, the sync option in FIO2. Other benchmark, of course, will, will have different patterns and we'll need to check. Yeah, that. so I assume actually zoned devices are not like the metadata intensive workload is not actually the workload you would like to use for zoned block devices anyway, but maybe as an interesting data point, it would be interesting. Yes, such a so test. I'd say the main, the workload of, of SMR drive is just to write, mostly write once, never delete anything. But the files has can be anything. I mean, I think uh, Facebook cat pictures and uh, a rocks DB SS table, uh, yeah. basically file. These are, that's why we chose kind of the, these sizes. And uh, so just just the, the file size different, uh, changes the ratio of data versus, uh, to metadata and, and clearly small files will have still a lot of, uh, a lot of metadata with a lot more things. So we need to be competitive there too, so. Okay, understood. Um, you tied the um, um, round robin method for super blocks yeah. to the sound pointer. Yes. So um, the nice thing I uh, I found with the whole patch set was that it's more or less independent of the underlying hardware. Most of the things were just enabling, disabling features. So 
they just happen to align with the feature, uh, with the actual hardware. So by relying on the sound pointer there, you actually have a direct tie-in to the hardware because, well, it's the sequential, uh, it's the, um, the SMR drive which provides you with the sound pointer. Yes. Um, at the same time, there might be a benefit of having a purely log-structured version of ButterFS, even for normal hardware. Uh, so that, you, that you're yes. writing sequentially, purely sequentially, even for normal hardware. Yes, we could so do that. So are there thoughts of enabling your modifications even for normal hardware? Uh, we haven't thought of it because our hands were kind of full already with that, that one. Really? But uh, I definitely can, could, or can think of advantages for even for regular SSDs. I maybe not for regular SSDs. I don't think we'll see any difference, really. Possibly not, but for SSD, it might be a different. Yes, the, uh, that may be yes uh, one result uh, there. Uh, that said, it's, it may be harder to get the benefit though because you don't really know uh, with a regular SSD what the erase block size is behind it, it and it may not even be a power of two thing. So. But yeah, uh, once all this, this is in place, it will be fairly trivial to, uh, to, to run mostly the same uh, on a regular drive. You basically only have to say, okay, it's zoned and then do. Okay, Just thank do you. The thing. So. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.